Hello my friends, how are you? Welcome back. This is Sean Ferrick for What Culture, and we're going to be going through all of the ups and downs for the second episode of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Now, if you've been joining us, you know how this works. We go to everything that we like and we give it an up, and everything that we didn't like and we give it a down. Last week's episode, or should I say the first episode, because I'm so used to saying last week, but we got the two episodes on the one day. It was a very, very strong start. If you haven't seen that episode of our ups and downs yet, make sure that you go and check that out now and also it'll give you an idea of kind of where I stand on the series so far and also some things you might think might be missing from the ups and downs from this episode that we might have covered last week so so make sure that you last week there it is again make sure that you go and watch that episode so you see kind of what's going on where we're at we better talk about the episode so without much further ado let's go all of the ups and downs for the Lord of the Rings the Rings of Power season one episode two adrift Now, the episode's title generally refers to, of course, Galadriel and her trip across the Sundering Seas. I'm actually going to come to her in a few minutes because there's a few things to discuss kind of before we cover her storyline this week. And I want to go straight to the Harfoots, Nori and Poppy. And my first up of the week is going to Poppy. She gets some of the funniest lines this week. And it's, it's to do, I think, as well with the delivery of them. When the two Harfoots, they lift Mysterious Figure, who I'm pretty sure we all know who Mysterious Figure is, but we'll come to that, out of the crevice that was created by their impact into the Earth. He is obviously much bigger, but Poppy sums it up quite quickly. He's bleeding massive. Sorry, I just love the delivery of it because it's so simple, it's so funny, and it's also not something I was expecting in a high fantasy series. Now, of course, if we think back to, what did I say last week? I'm going to say the Peter Jackson trilogy. There's going to be a lot of this. But if we think back to that one, there's so much colloquialism and there's so much modern slang versus this high speech as well that it's something that carries over quite nicely. And having said that, still wasn't expecting her to go, ah, he's bleeding massive. And it just had me laughing so much as the two of them drag and pull this giant of a creature up the side of the hill in a wheelbarrow. We all knew that they were going to stop and speak and he was going to roll back down the hill. These, th th these things are rules, these things are known, and I'm very glad they didn't ignore it. Now, my second up of the week goes to Nori. Clearly, Nori is being set up as one of the lead protagonists in this series. And I think, so far, doing a great job, because I really do care about what happens with Nori. I am worried. I am worried. For her future. Now the reason I say that of course is because like I said last week I believe this character that they're helping to be a very confused Sauron. I don't know how much you know about Sauron but not well known for his friendship and that leaves me quite worried for these two Harfoots but particularly Nori who seems to be bonding with Sauron quite quickly. It has not been identified definitively as Sauron so you'd, all of this might be like hey no no they just found a nice old man in the woods and they're helping him. Isn't that nice? I don't get that feeling coming though. Throughout this episode throughout Nori and indeed Poppy's storyline as well I actually get this sort of impending sense of doom there is a moment toward the end where they begin to figure out how to communicate with, let's, I'm going to stick with the Sauron name here. What they do, they're holding these two lanterns which are filled with fireflies. Sauron uses the fireflies to depict a constellation of stars, which is where, you know, he needs to go, where he's from. However, this spell kills the fireflies. And it's both simple, there's no overt aggression in the actions here. There's no clear evil in what's happening but it's just enough to make everything very uncomfortable earlier on in the episode while trying to communicate with nori there is a scene in which you know again sauron is scratching into the dirt juxtaposed against a scene where nori's father breaks his ankle because of a snapped rope and there's the question in our minds is sauron responsible for this or was this a badly timed accident it has me worried 
for the future of the Harfoots in general. It could be just a, a you know, a, hopefully, as I say, a, a bait and switch where, you know, maybe, maybe this is just a really tall bloke who needs a shave and a haircut and, you know, isn't very good with fireflies. And then great, everyone lives happy ever after, unless you're a firefly. A way back with in Eregon with Celebrimbor and Elrond begins my next up of the week. Celebrimbor is a massive, massive character in Tolkien history who didn't appear in either the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit trilogies. Celebrimbor is the person responsible for making the Rings of Power. Massively important, obviously, in a series called The Rings of Power. He is depicted in this episode as someone whose ambitions come from a great place. There is discussion of the Silmarils and Morgoth, which of course happened way before this story begins, and in fact way before the um, <clears throat> copyright for this series is allowed to discuss longer story outside of this. He looks back and sees the power of the Silmarils and Feanor, who is effectively his predecessor, and wants to do something good for the world. In this episode, what we see is he wants to build the greatest forge ever known, that something where the fire is as hot as dragon flame and, you know, something that could make something so powerful. He's giving this sales pitch to Elrond. And it's a really, really clever way of making us aware of the good in the ambition of the character that you know is going to lead to absolute disaster. It's again this great depiction of how, how our own hopes can lead us down some very dark paths. Celebrimbor's story is probably going to be one of the key ones throughout the run of The Rings of Power. Now, this discussion between Celebrimbor and Elrond uh, as to, you know, who's going to help build this forge, Celebrimbor says that he's going to need, you know, the, the greatest workforce that the world has ever seen. And Elrond knows that, you know, the High King has already said, not with my blokes, it's not going to be. So Elrond says, actually, I might have another idea for you. I've got a buddy who lives over by some hills. Let's go visit his house. Up, we see Khazad Doom in its glory. Now, of course, you'll remember from the Fellowship of the Ring that the Mines of Moria become one of the darkest parts of the journey of the Fellowship. It's been completely overrun with orcs. There's a Balrog of Morgoth in there as well. Basically, it's not a very nice place to go on holiday. At that point in history, at this point in history, it is one of the greatest cities in Middle-earth. And it is stunningly realised. I mean, I knew it was going to appear in the series and yet I didn't realise how much I wanted to see this version of Khazad Dun. I'm not going to say we've explored every nook and cranny because we haven't, but what we see is a fully functioning city that is worthy of all of the praise that Gimli was lauding on it in the Fellowship of the Ring. It is, it is everything I wanted it to be. Full disclosure, the journey through Moria is one of my favourite parts of the Fellowship of the Ring. This depiction in this episode, while beautiful as it is, stunning as it is, what it also does is it hammers home, pun intended, the tragedy of what we know is going to happen in the future to Khazad Doom. It is a beautiful scene. This entire storyline, in fact, throughout the episode, I really, really enjoy the all of the interplay between Elrond and Durin and the reveal that happens there. I, yeah, this was this was one of the strongest parts of the episode for me. The biggest up, though, that I'm taking from that storyline, so up, is why Durin is so angry at Elrond. So Elrond has told Celebrimbor that my best friend in the whole world, Durin, is going to be, you know, the you know, great help. It's all fine. Knocks on the door. And I mean, I, I burst out laughing. I was like, I seek to meet Durin. No. What? And I just love it. It was so simple. It was just, just no. And I just, I, I laughed a lot. And Celebrimbor just kind of looks at Elrond and says, I thought you said he was your friend. They get into a hammering contest, which is as funny as it sounds. And... Durin says, well, you've lost, so I'm going to escort you out. And Elrond, you can see he's so puzzled. Why, why is Durin so angry at him? You know, Durin says, it's been 20 years. And Elrond goes, got it, you know, it feels, has it only been 20 years? And Durin goes, that's the problem. That's the up, is exploring when 
you are friends with an immortal, time moves differently. And Durin has to explain to Elrond why 20 years is a long time to not pick up the phone. In that time, Durin has got married, Durin has fathered children, and Elrond, to him, it was a weekend. And that I thought was such a clever way of helping the audience to realize this difference in the perception of time between characters like the elves and characters like the dwarves. And the dwarves themselves are quite long lived. Both races are longer lived than most of the men. We will, we will meet some races of man which are slightly longer lived later in the series. It was a great moment between friends. And then once Elrond is aware of his accidental crime, there is no argument is, I apologize. I, I 100 I am sorry, and I want to apologize to your family. And there was a fantastic, I love Duran's family so much. Oh, I just love, it's such a wonderful, wonderful scene. And his two little kids running out with the big giant heads on them as well. It's just, it's just great. And I buy the fact that these two characters, they were great friends and hopefully will be again. Over in the other parts of Middle-earth, and particularly back where we're going to go and meet with our human characters, and of course Arondir as well, in the Southlands, we go to the village that we find out has been completely hollowed out, and it's on fire, and there's a, a, a sad little moment where Bronwyn and Ar Arondir walk into a house, and Bronwyn says, this was Kieran and Hannah's house. It's just this tiny moment that just humanizes the whole scene so quickly. Now they discover a tunnel has been dug underneath, which quite frighteningly reminds us all about when Theo back at home was talking about the rats tunneling underneath the house. Wonder if that'll come back. Arondir bids Gr Bronwyn to get back to their village. He's gonna go and check out this tunnel because they both know that Listen, this wasn't rats. So Bronwyn runs all the way back to the village and she's so tired and she gets back there and she's clearly in distress and she's clearly, you know, uh, uh, down, stupid villagers. Now, I know you might be like, listen, that's part of the story and everything. It's just, it's a frustrating trope. But I feel that all of the villagers don't believe you despite the fact that you are clearly insistent and quite frankly, she has a good reputation in the village. It was just slightly frustrating. Yes, they use it to set up the scene that follows and that is sure, but that to me was a bit, don't turn someone who was in the previous episode, a respected member of the village into, oh, that's that's just crazy Bronwyn being crazy. Now, no one says that, but it's it's frustrating. And, and unfortunately, it does stick out of the episode just, just a little too much. Down in the tunnel, Arondir, who is a skilled huntsman, notices that, you know, there's, there's things moving at either ends of the tunnel. There's a great scene, which is very uncomfortable, where rats start running past him. But of course, this gives you the idea of what what are the rats scared of? What are they running from? And, you know, there's a moment where he kind of gets down into a little subterranean lake of water, comes back up, he sees bubbles in the water and he's ready to go. And he is taken by surprise from behind by some orcs. Down. I'm afraid that was a down to me because, again, Arondir is supposed to be this great hunter. And while I, d I do have sympathy for he's in an extreme situation, it seems as though there's maybe, there's many hands, maybe as much as three or four orcs around him. And we're led to believe he didn't hear any of them coming. Unfortunately for me, it was a bit like, great hunter. Sorry, Rondir, that's, that's, uh, that's taking a few points off you. I want to take a second. I want to, I want to leave the Southlands for a second. And I want to go back to the Sundering Seas. We see Galadriel swimming across this ocean. Now, thankfully, she has the strength of, you know, a high elf, or otherwise, uh, she's anything like me, I would have been gone in about five minutes. Yeah, she hasn't even lost her knife. Now, she comes across this raft of survivors of a ship that was broken apart by a sea serpent. And initially, she's welcomed with open arms, but once they discover she's an elf, they're much, much less than friendly and you know, effectively, she's pushed off the raft again. Now, thankfully, she is pushed off the raft because about three seconds later, this great worm returns and destroys the raft. You know, see you later, survivors. All except for one. And I want to give an up this week to Galadriel and 
Halbrand. Whether or not they get set up as a romantic pairing, I, I don't know. We know that, you know, about a thousand years in the future, yeah, Galadriel's got another husband, but Halbrand is at least assumed to be mortal, so there could easily be this thing. But what we do get is a very good back and forth between both of them. They don't welcome each other with open arms. They're very much, they are two survivors using the same platform to get by. And we find out as the episode goes on that Halrond is running from the destruction of his home by orcs, which, you know, allows Galadriel to sort of go, well, hang on, I've been looking for orcs longer than you've been alive. What do you mean? Where are you from? Now, he says that he's from the Southlands. Now, what do we know? Back in the Southlands, Bronwyn and Arondir are having issues. So how did they get away? Where are they coming from? Are they in fact from this village that we just saw burning? What we do know is that Haubrand has information that is crucial to Galadriel's hunt for orcs and for Sauron. So we see a very unlikely partnership coming up. They quite literally met entirely by chance. And it doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel like, oh yeah, of all the oceans in all the world, she swam into mine. No, it feels natural. It feels like a, a solid pairing. And in fairness, I am glad that they do meet up because otherwise one or both of them were probably absolutely screwed when that storm was coming along. This was in the trailer before seeing the raft being buffeted by these high waves. And quite frankly, you know, the stakes are high. We know Galadriel will survive. We don't know Halbrand will survive. But in fact, it is Galadriel who needs help. She gets knocked unconscious and pulled under the waves by a weight that is rapidly sinking toward the bottom. Halbrand dives in after her. Of course, this is his hero moment of the episode. And using her brother's knife is able to bring her back to the surface. Then with a switch, it's she who pulls him up onto the raft. I like very much so far that they are being shown together as if not equals in stature, then certainly equals in this situation. Very, very strong characterization and excellent performances by both actors this week. The end of the episode sees them pass out on the raft. Someone is looking at them. We'll see where that goes. So I have a very strong up and that is for the orc in this episode. This orc was scary. And I mean, like, I mean, this was Oh, oh, I'm uncomfortable watching this. Excellently, excellently directed and depicted. Those long talons, the skull covering the sunken face, the way the close-ups, oh yeah. I have to say, this was excellent. Like this was an orc I was actually uncomfortable watching. One of, I suppose, the issues when you have hundreds of thousands of orcs in a scene is that they sort of blend somewhat into each other. This was one right up and close. There was no kind of witty statements. There was no threats. This was, this was an orc that wanted to kill this family. Down is Theo this week because of two things. One, Theo hid in the cupboard while his mum was in the room. Now, okay, the orc wasn't currently there, but he was just like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to stay here. So it's like, oh, thanks, Theo. Nice one, mate. And yeah, quite frankly, quite frankly, I'm not loving Theo so far as a character. Same down, but Theo playing with the Morgul bl blade at the end of the episode is like, this is clearly an evil item. Don't, what are you doing? So for me, I'm going to introduce to our ranking system. So when something is that bad, I'm sending it to the cracks of doom and Theo, you're on your way, buddy. Crack a doom for you. But let me counter with up for Bronwyn because she is fantastic in this episode, the way she takes on that orc. But to counter our crack of doom for our lowest ranking moment of the episode, our one ring goes to Bronwyn and the way she walks triumphantly back into that tavern slams the orc's head down on the counter and basically says, so does anyone have any questions? Get out of the village if you want to live. It was brilliant the way it was shot because there is a, a quite an intense fight in the house and that orc in fairness has taken quite a few stabbings. But when she runs at it and the next thing we see is that orc's head being slammed on the counter, I was like, yeah, all right, yeah, okay, right, prominent. You're doing security because I want to hire you. You're, you're unreal. 
So she gets our one ring up of the week. The last scene of the episode that we're going to talk about this week is what I think is possibly... Now, I'm smiling because it's a serious scene. So Durin and his father are discussing something we can't tell Elrond about. And it is because there is a box from which we see, you know, so we're standing behind the box as it opens and we see their faces and we see the light being shined on them. So the first thing that that tells me is that Marcellus Wallace's soul is in that box. But another thing I just want to know is, ah, oh, what's in the box? What's in the box? I love a bit of a mystery. It could be, it could be anything. It could be a Silmaril. It could be, you know, a prototype for a ring. It could be the Arkenstone. It could be someone's torch they left on. I like that we don't know. And I like how this mystery was left at the end of the episode. That is everything for this week, folks. What did you think of this week's episode? Let us know in the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe again. I've already said why, but I'm going to say it again. This series lives and dies by the interaction by you, the audience. So please share this far and wide. Please make sure that you like and please make sure that you comment. That is just a massive favor from you to me. Thank you so much. Remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at WhatCulture and you can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. So tune back in for episode three, which will of course be coming next week. Look after yourselves in that time. Make sure that you stay safe. Make sure that you are just, just taking it easy. Just relax. To our friends in Ukraine, we love you. Stay strong. Everyone, have a wonderful week and I will see you soon.